Hello, everyone. My name is Bruce Monkler, and welcome to another episode of Shots with Soldiers. This is where we tell a story about a, uh, a Canadian uh, veteran, soldier, group, uh, battle, and we toast to their memory, in, uh, and yeah, we have a shot. Uh, the general uh, sends his regards. He's unable to join us, but we do have a special guest here today, uh, Mr. Stephen Thorne. And he's going to do a presentation on his soldier. So thank you for having us, Stephen, and I'll let you take it away. Hi. So uh, excuse me if I have to refer to my notes. I, I did a feature on our subject tonight, James Andrew Watson, who was a uh, Lancaster pilot from Hamilton, Ontario. And uh, he, uh, that's him right there. At 21, he was the youngest member, uh, the oldest member of his seven man crew. His crew, his bomber crew, was made up of four Canadians and three Brits. They fell under the uh, jurisdiction of Bomber Command, and uh, the crews were often mixed, often from multiple uh, Commonwealth nations. Uh, the way it uh, worked out at the time. The Americans uh, were bombing uh, daylight raids and the Brits bomber command crews were uh, flying at night. Uh, and under bomber, in bomber command for every 100 airmen who flew, uh, 45 were killed, six were wounded, eight became prisoners of war and 41 would survive. That's, those were the expectations, the odds and uh, Jim Watson, as I said, he's from uh, Hamilton, Ontario. He was the son of Robert Scott Watson and Mary Kathleen Watson. And he was just 21 years old when he flew this mission in April of 1944. Many, uh, many uh, Lancaster pilots, many bomber pilots, uh, were, um, were considered for uh, VCs. Uh, in Canada, only uh, uh, Minarski was uh, the only one that uh, earned a VC or was awarded a VC. Uh, there were many, I think, that probably earned them, but the volume and the uh, fog of war and uh, just uh, what was going on at the time I think inter interfered with a lot of uh, those processes. Uh, there were other things on people's minds. So on the night of uh, April 27th and 28th, uh, our guy Watson and his seven member crew uh, flew out of England for Frederickshaven uh, in Germany. Frederickshaven was a, uh, a resort town on a lake in Southern Germany. Uh, near the Austrian uh, border. And uh, it was, um, uh, the funny thing about Frederickshaven is that it was a resort town, a Nazi resort town, but it was also an industrial center. Uh, they built Zeppelins there. They built uh, Dornier bombers there, uh, other aircraft and uh, V2 rockets, um, most of them by slave labor. So, uh, it was sometime after midnight that they set out. Uh, aircraft RND uh, would never reach its target, however. Uh, but Watson's heroic actions that night, that very dark night over occupied territory, would inspire uh, his crew to launch a campaign to award him a posthumous Victoria Cross. Uh, as I said, three RAF crew, four RCAF were. Uh, at 17,000 feet as they approached the turning point into the target. They were 30 minutes out on their final run uh, when suddenly they were attacked from dead astern and below by three Junkers uh, Ju-88 night fighters. And uh, the numbers are disputed. Some say it was four, some say it was three. I've even read two. Uh, it was about 1.30 a.m. and they were a little south of uh, Strasbourg, France. Uh, the attack, said Ron Hayes, the bomber's uh, mid-upper gunner, was a complete surprise. There was no moon. It was just complete darkness out there. 
Uh, the aircraft uh, uh, was equipped with a, a H20 or H2S uh, radar system, uh, which transmits pulses. And unbeknownst to the crew and uh, and the RAF, uh, they were not aware that uh, the Germans were able to home in on that signal. So the crew could hear the thuds as the German uh, rounds hit the rear of the aircraft and they saw flashes on the, as the port elevator uh, badly buckled. The rear gunner was RCAF Flight Sergeant Murdoch McKinnon. He was a Cape Breton native living in Somerville, Massachusetts when he signed up. Later reported that his radio and turret were knocked out. RAF Sergeant Roy Clive Eames, the flight engineer, said that the initial attack had also penetrated the plane's nose and knocked out one, uh, its aileron and rear controls. Uh, McKinnon was out of commission and nobody in the crew knew his status, whether he was alive or dead. Um, Hayes directed the, the pilot's evasive actions from up in the middle turret there. They were essentially flying blind, however. Uh, from his vantage point atop the lengths, uh, Hayes could see uh, their attackers' approaches and had to make his calls based on the tracers that were arcing past his canopy. Watson began corkscrewing as the attacking aircraft came close in again from 350 meters. Hayes described his pilot's response to his evasive directions as magnificent, but still the length was hit in the starboard inner engine. And within 30 seconds, the wing and the engine were burning. The fire extinguisher system had no effect. Watson uh, was uh, flying his 16th mission, just 21 years old, and he side slipped. He used his, uh, his uh, rudder to angle the plane so that the flames would blow away from the fuselage. Uh, the maneuver amounted to a trade-off. The fire didn't reach the crew, but they were losing altitude fast. Uh, McKinnon reported later that uh, the captain asked the navigator at this time to inform the crew of their position uh, uh, so that they, uh, they could escape. The, naviga the navigator told us we were approximately on the French border, he said. There was at no time any suggestion of panic, and this was largely due to the coolness and perfect calm of our captain. Throughout the combat, Watson repeatedly asked for news of the rear gunner with whom he'd flown all of his missions, and he assured the rest of the crew that he would look after him no matter what. Whatever happens, he said, he'll be okay. At the words, uh, he'll be okay, Eames knew uh, and said in a statement uh, on July 25th, 1946, that uh, Flight Lieutenant Watson would not leave that aircraft while there was still the slightest doubt that a member of his crew remained inside, and as a last resort, he would attempt a crash landing to save that member of his crew. As the uh, fuselage scene after the burning engine began to melt, Watson directed the crew to collect their parachutes, and soon the wing was almost totally engulfed, and a gaping hole was forming in the side of the plane. I'm sorry, lads, said Watson, but you'll have to hit the silk. Uh, Hayes said he then plugged into the intercom system and informed the pilot that the rear gunner was still in his turret and that he would let him know when uh, that when they were all to get out. Now, the captain's last words to me uh, said Hayes were, yes, okay, but hurry. We're at 4,500 feet. If he's not hit, he might make it. So long, Ron. Good luck. Hayes was just 19 at the time. He opened the bulkhead door leading to the rear turret McKinnon tur turned his head and Hayes patted his parachute. Then the rear gunner uh, turned away without acknowledging the news. The aircraft was now at about 4,000 feet uh, and Hayes bailed out. Uh, the pilot had the aircraft under perfect control, he said, and was still losing height in a sinking fashion and the flames had enveloped the fuselage along the burning wing, alongside the burning wing. In a report on the incident filed in May 6, 1945, weeks after they were liberated from prison camps, uh, McKinnon said the Lancaster was badly damaged. Without intercom, he said he was entirely ignorant of uh, proceedings until Hayes appeared. That's the rear gunner, McKinnon. Uh, starboard elevator in tail shot off, reported McKinnon. Navigator, that's flying officer William Ransom of Hamilton, 
stated that the pilot was last seen holding the stick hard to port. When I bailed out, said McKinnon, the aircraft was a blazing mass in a dive, so it seems impossible that pilot got out. I bailed out when flames were passing the rear turret. As Ransom took his turn at the escape hatch, the third to go, he took one last look at Watson still at the controls. He said he was having difficulty uh, maintaining the aircraft in a level flight. Leaving the aircraft and releasing my parachute, I was able to watch the burning aircraft almost until it crashed, Ransom later wrote. It remained level, laterally, and in a shallow dive for much longer than would have been necessary. Flight Lieutenant, uh, for life left, Flight Lieutenant uh, Watson, to reach the escape hatch and bail out, uh, a fact which leads me to believe that he remained at the controls in order to allow the rear gunner, whom we are all under the impression was injured, as much time as possible to clear his turret. McKinnon, he later learned, got cleared just in time to have his fall checked by his parachute before reaching the ground. Uh, Hayes, who had directed Watson through the attack, landed hard in an open field. He blamed the impact on his uh, uh, low-level escape, a disconcerting delay in the deployment of his uh, ill-serviced parachute, and a lack of uh, instruction in its use. The action with the German fighter, craft, fighter aircraft, he said, the difficulty in evacuating our aircraft and the bailout and hard landing in the dark were very stressful experiences, and the right side of my body and lower back were aching. He was dizzy. He rested for a few hours uh, where he had landed out in the open. And as daylight approached, he rose to search for a hiding place in a wood or a barn. But the pain was so bad, he only managed to make it to a nearby ditch where he was discovered by a local and taken to the Alsace village of Guimar. He was interviewed by a young girl who could speak some English before he was taken to the village hall around 1 a.m. on April 28th. Here I met a schoolmistress, Madame Louise Stroll, who gave me tea, biscuits, and tobacco. And then she told me that Flight Lieutenant Watson had been found dead at the controls of the aircraft. She went to some length in describing him, even saying that he was a Canadian and that he had two stripes on his epaulets. The lady was sympathetic and wanted to cheer him up but, uh, and make him feel at home, even though she couldn't help him escape. The village hall had become crowded with local inhabitants who might have helped, me, helped him escape if it was not for their uh, fears of the Gestapo. A pair of Luftwaffe intelligence officers took Hayes and to Colmar, France for interrogation. After the usual questions, he said, I was asked if I could help them in identifying the belongings of a dead pilot. The items were those of Flight Lieutenant Watson in an envelope consisting of his identification bracelet and a ring. I knew the ring had been given to Jimmy by his father. The Germans had said they had taken the articles from a pilot who was found dead at the controls of his aircraft. I uh, actually they specified Lancaster and I said nothing to them for fear that it might be the uh, beginning of a long interrogation and I also knew that the identity bracelet was sufficient. Hayes surmised that Watson had died trying to save the rear gunner McKinnon. At Colmar he saw three of his crewmates but they didn't speak to each other for fear the Germans might be listening. Eames and Hayes were taken to Stalag Luft 6, while officers Ransom and W.H. Russell were separated. On the way to the POW camp, Eames told Hayes he had seen McKinnon. Seeing him gave me a severe shock as I convinced myself that he'd been killed, Eames reported. In fact, all six crew who had escaped the burning plane had miraculously survived and were liberated in the spring of 1945. Hayes, an Englishman, would emigrate to Canada in 1951, largely based on the impressions left by his Canadian crewmates. In a letter written while still a POW in January 1945, Ransom asked his father, a padre at the Canadian Army Trade School, to please see Jimmy's folks and give them my deepest sympathy. He died like a hero in the fullest meaning of the word. He reached the ultimate in courage and devotion to duty that a bomber skipper can can reach and that he gave his life that his crew might live and he was successful as all of us are safe. I am looking forward to meeting the parents of the grandest guy I've known when this war is over. Uh, Eames called Watson the bravest and coolest fellow I had ever met. 
adding, we all owe our lives to him. Uh, in 1946 and 47, five members of the crew put forward recommendations for the Victoria Cross to be awarded to their, uh, their skipper. I firmly believe that it would be impossible for an aircraft as in as badly damaged conditions as was ours to remain in such an attitude of flight without any assistance from, uh, from the controls, reported Ransom, who had flown many missions with Watson. I'm convinced that on this occasion, he unhesitatingly made his decision and at the cost of his own life, remained at his post to ensure that his crew would have every possible opportunity and every valuable second of time to abandon the aircraft and save their lives. It's quite clear, said Hayes, that Flight Lieutenant Watson sacrificed his life knowingly and willing to, willingly to ensure the safety of his crew. His most courageous act, his great and noble sacrifice in the face of the enemy was beyond the highest ideals of his duty and merits the highest possible award for gallantry and for valor in the face of the enemy. Watson's nomination for a VC, however, went nowhere. He received only a mention in dispatches. James Watson is buried at Cholet War Cemetery at uh, Mirth en Moselle, et Moselle, France, grave number 1A, B23. A monument was dedicated on May 8, 2009, near the crash site in saint hippolyte France. And that's the story of James Watson. And here's to him. Cheers, cheers to James Watson. To him, absolutely. Yes. Oh, that was amazing. Thank you. I just wanted to say, you know, uh, uh, Stephen Thorne, I should have given you a better introduction than just saying, here's Stephen. But he's an award winning writer. Obviously, you can tell he could spin a yarn. Uh, he's a photographer, editor, and broadcaster. He covered the fall of the South African apartheid in 1994, and has reported extensively from the war fronts in Kosovo and Afghanistan. His stories and photographs have been published worldwide, and his work anchored two major uh, exhibitions at the Canadian War Museum. His, honor, his honors over 40 years in journalism include three national newspaper awards, four RTNDA broadcast awards, two Canadian Press Stories of the Year, and the first ever Ross Munro Media Award for Excellence in def uh, Defence Reporting. He was awarded a silver medal in photojournalism and a photo essay at the 2019 National Magazine Awards for his Legion Magazine project, Citizens of War. And I'd like to add that the recent Jess Low Rochelle story that uh, was published uh, uh, in regards to our project uh, was also written by Stephen and has, uh, to this point, reached about 50,000 shares. So that was great. Uh, we'll open it up for any questions that you may have. Um, we shared this, he wrote this story about a month ago. We shared it on our page and we actually found some people that were related to some of the crew members uh, that, that commented uh, on, uh, on our posts. So that was pretty cool. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I do. Giselle. Mr. Thorne, um, you mentioned that he was from, uh, Captain Watson was from Hamilton, Ontario, and that a monument was put up in 2009. So. You muted yourself, Giselle. A monument went up in. And then if there's one in Hamilton for where he's from. You, you kind of got cut off there. Oh, sorry. Um, I, was, I was curious if you, if you knew why it took so long for a monument to be erected, because you said it was 2009. And then if there was one, anything in his hometown of Hamilton. I don't know if there's anything in his hometown. Um, the, the children of this crew are all in contact with one another. And uh, they, they got in touch with me too after we ran the piece. And uh, it's, it hasn't run in the magazine yet. I, I do a weekly column for the magazine. And uh, this was one of my columns. And it was actually it's a couple of months ago now. And um, uh, because of the stuff that the, the uh, family members are uh, sending me, I'm gonna, we're going to do a, a print version of this story. And I'm going to look into stuff like, you know, is there a monument to him in Hamilton? And, 
and uh, hopefully I'll get over there at some point and see the monument to him in, uh, in St. Hippolyte. Any other questions? Yeah, I've got a question about flying the Lancasters. There's so many Canadians that, why were there so many Canadians uh, flying Lancasters? I don't know, but uh, you know, we, uh, Canada um, had a rich history between the wars of aviation. Our, our geography uh, fostered a great aviation culture in Canada and in and industry early on. And so we did produce a lot of pilots. And, uh, and then Canada uh, was the uh, Commonwealth Air Training Plan. Uh, there were, I, don't, I forget how many uh, airfields in Canada were, um, were dedicated to tr uh, training Commonwealth pilots and air crew. And so there were a lot of Canadians signed up and they couldn't all be uh, fighter pilots. Um, and the funny thing is those big lumbering aircraft, those guys loved them. Any uh, Lancaster pilots I've talked to and I've talked to a few just thought they were the most beautiful plane in the world. <laughs> so I'd take a Spitfire myself. But. I guess I have a corollary because there were so many Canadians. Is, that, is it because of so many Canadians flew Lancasters that um, he didn't get the proper due. He didn't get uh, the award that he clearly deserves. Well, you know what it was like in those times? They, uh, there, were, there was so much going on. There were so many uh, acts of uh, heroism or sacrifice. And, um, and I've talked to people since this story ran who said, you know, there were many incidents like that. There were a lot of bomber pilots who kept their plane aloft so that their crews could get out. And uh, that was the, the story of uh, Minarski and his Lancaster, where his, uh, his tail gunner was uh, stuck in, the, uh, in his uh, uh, position there. It couldn't get out. And Minar everybody else had bailed out. Minarski went to the back of the plane and tried and tried to get this guy out. And then he couldn't. And the guy told him, waved him off, waved him off. And Minarski went to the door, saluted the guy and jumped. Minarski didn't survive. Uh, the plane crashed and the tail gunner survived, lived to tell the story. And uh, it was a compelling story, but I'm sure there are, there's more than and a couple of stories like that. Any other questions? I think we got time for one more. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, Stephen. Um, I know Lancaster is a very beautiful aircraft, uh, but do you actually, uh, do you think that the uh, uh, tail gunner uh, position was probably one of the most dangerous ones? And especially with, uh, with Mike, Mike Karski, and uh, the one that you just said about how the, uh, the door got stuck. Do you think that was like a very uh, fatal uh, flaw within the aircraft? Yeah, well, a couple of those, like the belly, the belly uh, gun in a in a B seventeen is not a very enviable spot either. But I think I think the tail gun, the tail gunner, in just about any bomber is in one of the most vulnerable positions anywhere. That's the first first place that's going to get hit. When a, when a plane is attacked from behind, they're going for the engines, but they, they obviously want to take out the tail gunner first. So uh, it's, it's like La Rochelle, you know, that, that machine gun was the, one of the first things that would attract fire. So yeah, they're in a very vulnerable position. Okay, that's perfect. Uh, thank you again, Stephen, for coming on and filling in for the general. You filled those boots uh, magnificently. Uh, another great story, another great soldier. Uh, this has been another, this has been the ninth episode of Shots with Soldiers. Uh, the next episode is going to be with global television uh, host, uh, Kevin Newman. And we are happy that you guys joined us. Please share, like our posts. Uh, we need as much uh, to get out there as possible. And have a great Thursday evening and a great weekend. Talk to you guys later.
Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming out.